Um, so I'm very excited to be here today, and I hope that you are as well. I'm going to be speaking to you about building better desktop applications with Ember. My name is Estelle DeBlois, and you can follow me on Twitter at eDeBlois. I'm also on GitHub at BRZ Pegasus. So I started working with Ember about two years ago, over two years ago now. And I have to say that it's been such an incredible experience to see how much Ember has grown within that time period. There have been so many new and exciting features that have emerged from the framework. Um, and uh, you, know, you can't deny that Ember has been moving really fast. And now the first beta um, for 2.0 was just released. So that's really awesome. Um, <laughs> but there's, there is some, something else that I find as equally important and crucial to Ember's growth, and it's the community itself. This is a picture that was taken at last year's Wicked Good Ember conference. And I was standing right there, and right behind me and also around, you may recognize all the happy and friendly faces that made up Dockyard. And we didn't know each other then, but um, this year at this conference, um, I have to say that I feel fortunate to be able to call myself a dockyarder. So <laughs> I joined the team later that summer. If you don't already know, Dockyard is a design and software consultancy um, right in Boston. And so we build web apps, lots of web apps, using Ember because we believe that it's the best framework for creating rich, powerful, and beautiful user experiences. And over the last year, we've also had the opportunity to build for the native desktop. And that's what this talk is all about. Today, I want to give you a taste of what it's like to build a number app for th that environment. Uh, there are five sections total. There's going to be a demo in each section. And hopefully, you will walk away with a good understanding of the sort of challenges that are present in that environment. And um, you'll see how we were able to leverage Ember and Ember CLI to help us along the way. So let's dive in. If someone came to you today and asked you to build a native desktop app, what would you choose to build it with? I, um, I have written some desktop apps um, for my parent of, in the past, and they were all written with Java Swing. Uh, this must have been like seven years uh, ago or so. Um, but today, the landscape has changed quite a bit, and we have a lot of new options available to choose from. This is a screenshot of a desktop application that you may recognize. You may use this um, on a daily basis for your coding. This is the Atom Editor. It was developed by GitHub. And while it may not be apparent to you, this was written with CoffeeScript and styled with CSS. And what made it possible was a framework called Electron. It's an open source project, also developed and maintained by the GitHub team. And it lets you build cross-platform desktop applications with web technologies. Here's another example of a desktop application also written with web technologies. This is called Popcorn Time. And uh, you, can do, uh, you can do things like watch trailers. You can download movies, TV shows uh, from torrents. And uh, it uh, uses a runtime called NWJS, which you may have heard of in the past as the Node WebKit project. It's similar in concept to Electron, but it has been around much longer. And this is the technology that we uh, ended up using in our project at Dockyard. And this is what I'm going to focus my talk on today. So NWJS is an application runtime that is built on top of Chromium and Node. And so when you build web pages, they get rendered in a Chromium window. Um, there's no web server involved. Your pages are loaded uh, from the local file system. And because NWJS also integrates Node into the browser, you also have access to all of the system level functionality that Node provides. 
you also have access to a native UI library so that you can add application menus, you can add things to the system tray, you can even manipulate how you want the application window to, um, to be like. So you can do a lot of things. I'm going to show you quickly what an NWJS application um, works and uh, hopefully you'll get some more context for the rest of this talk. So when you get started with NWGS, the first thing you want to do is go to the website and download the pre-built binary. Um, and it's, uh, there's one for different platforms. But what I found easier to do. Quick fix, I just want to fix the overscan because it's bleeding. Oh, whoops. Sides. I didn't realize. Yeah. Um, just go to the display settings. OK. It's, it's under scan right there, so back there and just drag it all the way to the right. All right, that okay. should be good enough. That didn't fix it. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe. Nope. I can just move it to the side. All right, can you guys see that? Can you read it in the back? OK. So, um, so I mentioned that you can go to the website and download the uh, pre-built binary. But I found easier to just install the NW NPM package instead. It's not a Java's report of the runtime. It's simply a package that will detect what platform you're running on. And it'll download the binary for you. So I have done that ahead of time. So here's my NW NPM dependency. I also have a very simple index.html page, as well as a package.json file. This file is really important. NWJS will look for this when it launches, and it'll look specifically for a field called main, which I have on line three. The main field needs to point to an HTML page, and that's gonna be the starting point of your desktop application. I also have some additional fields here. Uh, window, toolbar, false. What I'm telling NWJS to do is to hide the toolbar when the window comes up. Um, so window is one of many options that are available to you that you can specify in your package.json. So I'm just going to go ahead and launch it. Because I've um, installed the NW dependency, I can now run NW um, in the command line. And that's, oh, OK. So that's like, here we go. All right, so you get the uh, desktop application running, and it loaded the HTML page inside of that window. So um, that's basically how it works. And right now, there's nothing special, but you can see I've got some placeholders. Um, okay, so I've got some placeholders. I'm going to display the name of the current platform as well as the name of the, the user of this machine. So I'm going to go back up to the... Uh, index.html. So how would, you, how would you go about displaying the name of the platform? If you're in Node, right, you have this global variable called process, which has all of that information. But because we're in NWJS, that process variable is available to us as well. So you can do things like process.platform and it's going to be, uh, by the way, I'm not, I'm not Torrin Billup, so I cannot do Vim magic, so just bear with me. <laughs> um, okay, so for the username, it's really, it's something that is read off of environment variables. And the process object also has that information. So you can do things like process.env, and in this case, we want user. So I'm going to restart this, and when that comes up, you'll see that the values have been detected. It's showing Darwin for Mac and then BRC practices as the username. Um, so there's something else that I wanna show you. Uh, I mentioned earlier that you can do things with the native UI module. The way that you would require it in is by um, calling require nw.gui. It follows a very similar syntax as if you were to um, import node modules. So in this case, I'm going to just go ahead and do that. 
So I, I'm requiring um, NW.GUI, and from there, you have access to different things. So we're going to try to get the current application window. And you have many methods that are available to you here. You can use win. You can um, show the dev tools. You can resize. And I'm going to do, I'm going to instruct it to open the application in full screen now. And there you go. So a little cut off, but uh, you can see it's still uh, working. All right. So, so far, every time that I've had to make changes to this file, I had to restart the NW process all the time. And that's, that can get really annoying. You don't want to have to do that during development all the time. So how about, given that we can access node modules within here, why not try and do require FS? If you're familiar with node, you know there's this FS module that lets you do things with the file system. It has a watch method that lets you watch a directory. So I'm telling it to now watch the current directory. And then how about when something changes, we do a simple location reload. And so now if I were to run this, um, whoops, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remove the, uh, the full screen thing just a bit. All right, relaunching. And I'm going to bring this to the side. I know it's cut off, but um, you should still be able to see, get the idea. So up here, I'm going to just add some text. And then without doing anything else, you're going to see that that reloaded immediately. So very, very simple. Um, and that's NWJS in a nutshell for you. OK, so, so far, that was like really, really, uh, it was a very small chunk of code. Um, obviously, this is not how we would go about writing uh, a real application. You would always want to think about how to properly structure your project. And you would have to make decisions around your application architecture. And do you have views that you have to manage, routes, models, state? If so, then maybe Ember can help. So let's take a look at how we can use Ember together with NWJS to build more powerful desktop applications. This is a typical Ember app that you would get if you were to create it with Ember CLI. And as we saw earlier, the first thing you would have to do is bring in the NW dependency, update the package.json to have this main field pointed at your index.html file in the dist folder. And now, this, this thing is uh, unique to um, Ember, but uh, you want to go into the config environment JS file and uh, modify the router location type, set it to hash, so that it doesn't try and use history. That's because we don't have any web server involved. But um, so those three steps should get you uh, in a good stage to now build and launch the application. So normally, you would, you would run Ember serve, right? But, but because we don't need the server part, we can just do Ember build. And you can still pass a watch option so that your application files can still continue and rebuild as you modify them during development. So we leave that process running, open a new terminal window, run NW, and that's going to launch the Ember app as a desktop app. And that's really simple. That was all we had to do, right? At least it seems like it's working. However, if you now try and do anything with Node, or if you try and um, invoke the, the native UI module, um, you're going to get this error message. It's going to say, could not find module nw.gui. And um, that's because we're essentially in an environment where we've got browser code, and we have Amber co uh, Node code altogether, and certain things aren't going to play well together. So out of the box, NWJS defines this require function at the global scope. And you can use it, like we saw earlier, if you, if you specify the name of the module and the name is nw.gui, it's going to return you the native UI module. 
Otherwise, it's going to call the required function that exists in node. The problem is that when our Ember app loads, Ember CLI's module loader also defines a required function at the global scope, which means that it, it essentially is overriding the, whatever we had before. This required function now is used to load up AMD compatible modules that you would write in your application with ES2015 syntax. So there are several ways of dealing with this, but the uh, simplest approach is really to get a reference of the required function that existed beforehand from NWJS, save it to a non-conflicting variable name, load the app, and then at the end, redefine the required function to work with both module systems with a simple try-catch. So um, obviously, I mean, I know it's not a, a ton of config, but the, it's still boilerplate that you would have to bring into any new app that you want to build with NWJS. And whenever you find yourself doing a lot of copy-pasting, you know that it's time for an add-on. And so we made one. Um, this is, uh, this add-on is called Ember CLI Node WebKit. It's an extraction of the work that we have put into uh, the, the project at Dockyard. So I'm going to show you how the add-on can help you get started quickly with NWJS. Um, okay, so over here I have a, let me just fix this uh, window issue here. Okay, so I have um, a very bare bone Ember app. This was created with Ember CLI. The only thing that I've done at this point is run the Ember install command to get the add-on in it. And that's about it. Um, however, because I did that, I now have the NW dependency in the node modules folder. The add-on took care of doing that. It also took care of adding the main entry that NWJS requires. The configuration for your router is also handled automatically, as well as everything that uh, can uh, needs that is required to work around the uh, require naming conflict that we saw earlier. So all you have to do really is just install the add-on and then run your app. Um, so instead of doing Ember build and then open a new terminal and do NW, we're gonna use a new command that is given to us by the add-on as well for convenience. You can, do, you can do both things with just this one command, Ember NW. This is going to build the application and then as soon as the application is built, it's going to launch it in NW. And navigate back here, and here's our Ember app. So this was really simple to do. Um, also, uh, if you make changes to your application files during development, things will still continue to rebuild, and you will see the changes reflected in this window without having to do anything else. So that concludes this demo. Um, all right, so let, let's move on to development a little bit uh, now that we saw how to really uh, get started with this. So I don't know about you, but whenever I develop web apps, I like to have the dev tools open. I leave it open because uh, I, I, I inspect everything from um, error messages to deprecation warnings, but I also use the Ember Inspector a lot. I find it so helpful. You can see so many things that are part of your app, like what state it's in. You can check all the records that have been loaded into the data store. Sometimes you look in there and you find certain things that should have been cleaned up, but they weren't. So essentially, this uh, Ember Inspector is essential to my general development happiness. And when we started to develop the app in NWJS, it turns out that the Ember Inspector was not available in the dev tools that, um, in, in that environment. And in fact, none of your browsers are available to you as well. We're not dealing with Chrome, we're dealing with Chromium. This is like just the, the basic stuff. So, so of course we had to work around that. And so we realized in our project that even though we were building a desktop application, there were only certain parts 
that needed to do anything special with Node or the native UI. All of the other routes were not dependent on that, so there was no reason why we couldn't load those routes into Chrome or Firefox and do uh, our development and debugging um, there for those times where we need to focus just on those routes uh, in particular. So that's what we did. But we have to be able to detect which environment we're running in, because if we're not careful, we're going to run into issues when those things, when NWJS um, objects are undefined. We don't want the application to completely melt down. So to detect the environment, we can create a very simple module, let's call it environment.js, and then just put some flags that are uh, related to um, just um, whether or not we're in running in NWJS. So we could check for the presence of certain variables that we know would only be there if we're running in NWJS. And if they're not there, then we can set the is NW flag to false. That way, we can uh, use those values to determine whether we should be um, initializing the application with an application menu bar, or maybe we should just return if we're not in the right environment or do something else. So since I'm, I'm mentioning menus, like, let's see how we can go about handling menu interactions. In NWGS, the way that you would create a menu item is by um, just doing a GUI, new GUI.menuItem. This is a API that comes from the native UI module we saw earlier. So a menu item takes a label, it takes some keyboard shortcuts, and then it also takes a click handler. So this is where you define whatever you want to do um, when someone clicks on the, the menu. If this was an Ember component, then you would most likely do something like this, right? Send action, specify the name of the action, let that bubble up to some route. Um, also, I want to specify that this syntax is changing in 2.0, but I'm not going to um, go there. So given that we're not in an Ember component, the send action is not available to us. Um, but we have something else that Ember gives us, which is this mixing called Ember Evented. Ember Evented gives us ac access to these three methods, trigger, so that we can trigger a custom event, and then other objects can register and then unregister listeners for those custom events using on and off. Because it's a mix-in, we can easily mix it into an Ember service, because services can easily be injected into uh, different parts of the application. So let's say that we are able to inject the service into wherever our menu code lives. We can now do trigger and then specify the name of the menu event that, that occurred. So other parts of the application can now respond to those menu events by using the same service and register listeners um, for them. If we want, we can also be a little bit more expressive with this by creating a menu events hash and then just list out all of the menu event handlers uh, that we want. So this is following the same pattern that you have with the actions hash in, that you have in routes um, or components. Um, and it just makes things a little bit more declarative. So I'm gonna finish this section with a demo of a desktop application that can also run in the browser. Um, okay, so this was constructed with Ember CLI. It's using the Ember CLI Node WebKit add-on. So all I have to do is run Ember NW like you saw earlier in order to build this and launch it. So it's going to come up momentarily. And now we have this. Um, it's, it's basically, this is a simple markdown editor. You have an edit pane. You can just create uh, markdown uh, documents. You can preview them. There's also an application menu that lets you save um, this document to disk. And you can reload and, and all that, like reopen documents and edit them. So you get the idea. But now, if I, instead of running it with NWGS, I'm going to launch it in the browser with Ember Serve. Ember S is just a shortcut for the Ember Serve command. So I'm going to bring up a menu, uh, sorry, a browser, 
and uh, go here, let me blow it up a little bit. So it's the same Markdown Editor application. I can still um, edit Markdown syntax. Um, so the functionality is still there. The application is not broken. Even though we no longer have access to the application menu, and you no longer can save or open documents, but you can still, the application is still functional. All right, so I'm going to switch back to the slides. And we're going to move on directly into testing. So when it comes to testing, um, obviously doing a lot of the separation of concerns that you saw in those examples earlier really helps. Um, let's say if we keep with the same markdown editor example, if you have a document model that defines records that should be saved to disk and also reloaded from there, you can easily create a custom data adapter that, um, where you can um, override the find method and, and do all the things that deal with the file system stuff with, by requiring node modules. The problem is that now we've got the node code and the Ember code and it's all mixed together. It makes it difficult to test this. So we could try instead to just extract all of that node-heavy code into a service, um, and in that way you can easily stub the service during test. So now we know how to test this, but still, how do we test the, the, the Ember service that does all of this file-related stuff? Um, so when we dive deeper into the NWJS documentation, um, we found out that Besides main, you can also define, you can specify a node main field in your package.json, and that uh, would have to point to a node script that you want to execute on startup. This is usually used to run background tasks and whatnot, but we took that, um, it, it actually worked out really well for us. We um, used it to export, essentially expose all of the node-related API through this single script that the Ember app could then consume. And this is good because the, all of the node-related code can now live in node modules. And you can write tests for those node modules the same way that you would write tests for any other node modules. So anything that gets exported from that script can then be accessed from the browser using process.mainmodule.export. And then, so we have access to the file service because it's available off of that exports object. And we can even create computed aliases and everything to help us. So this is the, essentially the pattern that we adopted in our project at Duckyard. And it worked out really well. But then a couple months ago, somebody named Stephen Edward pinged me on GitHub in the add-on repo. And he said that he was working on this Azure Storage Explorer desktop app. Um, Microsoft, so um, Stephen Edward works at Microsoft, but they, they've already got this product that does this that's available, but it only works for Windows. And he wanted to create a cross-platform solution. So he decided to build it with Ember, and he decided to build it with the Ember CLI Node WebKit add-on. However, um, he wanted to use a test-driven development approach to build this. And unfortunately, at that time, the add-on did not have any kind of support for TDD or integration tests. So, so we, we um, brainstormed a little bit. And after much collaboration and many um, uh, contributions on his part, a new command was born. Today, if you were to install the add-on, you would have this new command available to you. And it allows you to run tests in a NWJS environment. So I will show you how that works, but let me just quickly explain the steps. So when you run the NW test command, it will invoke testum, and it will tell testum to launch the NW process. Typically, when you run Ember tests in your Ember app, your launchers would be things like Phantom.js or Chrome, but we can configure Testum to run any kind of process that we want. So tests are now going to run inside of the NWJS window, 
and all of the test results would have to get logged to the output stream in order for them to be picked up by Tustum and parsed out and displayed in the console. We also have to monitor whenever the test suite completes so that we can terminate the NWJS process. So um, there's also a server flag available that you can pass to this command. It's essentially the same thing. We're still configuring Tustum to launch the NWGS process, but we have to also open a WebSocket connection between that and Tustum, and that creates a two-way channel for communication between the two components. So uh, NWGS can send all of the test results back to Tustum to be displayed in this terminal um, window, and Tustum can also let um, NWGS know whenever files change and the tests need to rerun. So we're going to check that out in action. Um, so this is still the Markdown Editor application that you saw earlier, but I've got a bunch of tests written for them. So I'm just going to run NW test. So the application built, and then, okay, so that went really fast, but the test did run in an NWGS window, and then the window disappeared. That's because we knew the test terminated, and we closed out the, um, the process. And then all the results are now displayed in the console. So let's do the same thing, but now we're going to run it with the server flag. So the application is still going to build. All right, so now you can still see the test in this running in this uh, NWJS window. However, there's still the window did not close out when the tests were done. Uh, so now you can interact with the tests, you can do rerun them and whatever. And then over in the terminal, you also have the results reported by Tustum. This is still watching for file changes. So if I were to go into a test and change some stuff, make something fail, um, as soon as I save, the application rebuild, and then now you have the results of your failed test. So hopefully this will make things really um, easy moving forward to, to write integration tests for. Okay, so we're gonna, we, we saw development, we saw testing. We're going to finish up with packaging. So with packaging, you have to be able to identify the applications that the application files that you want to distribute um, in your final packaging, and then uh, zip them up into an archive file that has an NW extension. And then you want to merge that with the NWGS runtime, and that's going to produce a single executable file that you can ship to your users. Now that looks really simple, but the details do vary across different operating systems. So on Windows, for example, the final EXE that you get cannot function by itself. You also need to bundle some additional DLLs um, in order for things to work. And then on a Mac, the packaging steps are also different because the NWJS runtime is not a single binary, it's a folder. So now you have to place the application files inside the folder and distribute that. So those are all things that warrant some good automated script for. But there's already this NPM package out there called Node WebKit Builder that does all the work for us, and it's aware of uh, all the details in the different operating systems. So we can use this. It's, um, it's, it's uh, agnostic to build tools, so you can write a wrapper for it. And so we can simply extend Ember CLI and the add-on to invoke that library and do all the work for us. And so now you can do that with this command, which I'm going to demo. And this is going to be the final demo of the presentation. OK, so this is still the Markdown Editor app. However, I have some desktop icons in here, because you, you have to have desktop icons for your desktop apps. And I also have a configuration file. So this is where I specify that I want to build for these three platforms. Um, you don't have to specify any um, configuration file. If you don't, the add-on will just um, assume some defaults because they already understand your application structure. So all we have to do now is uh, run 
uh, Ember NW package. The first time that uh, you run this, the underlying Node WebKit module will um, it will download all the pre-built binaries for NWJS for all the platforms that you specify you want to package for. And so that way you don't have to re-download every time. It's going to cache those, um, those binaries. So in just a moment, you're going to see um, something. <laughs> all right, so packaging is done. If I were to go up here now and then open up this build folder, refresh, you now have a folder for each of the platforms that we specified. So in the Windows location, you've got the EXT file and all the DLLs that need to be shipped with. You don't have to go and hunt them down. And this is the bundle for Mac. So I'm going to open this up, and we can check it out. Um, all right, so I don't know if you guys can see this, but it's the uh, desktop application. We have the pretty icon. And all you have to do is ship this to your users. They can double click and get the application that we saw earlier. Uh, things are still functional. You have the application menu. You can uh, still um, do things. So it's still functional. And uh, yeah, so that was packaging in uh, just less than two minutes. So we covered a bunch of things today. Um, however, I do want to wrap up the talk quickly by going over how all of this can be used in the wild. So we saw many examples earlier with the Atom Editor, the um, Popcorn Time, the Azure Explorer desktop app. Um, it may be that some companies have a need for offline solutions or things that really don't need to be hosted anywhere. And at Dockyard, we build a desktop app for a fitness uh, club that specializes in indoor cycling. They needed to have an application that could be installed on the desktop to help instructors teach a class. So instructors could uh, run a class or run a race for a particular duration and they could see exactly who was participating in the class and how they were doing. All of the scores from riders were transmitted from bikes, because we had special devices attached to the bikes. And so all of the data were transmitted to the desktop app. And then you could see, as people were racing, all of their scores uh, show up in, in real time. So that was one of the cooler projects that we were able to do at Dockyard with this technology. Um, but you can also think of desktop applications that are powered with web technologies as a new way to distribute software. So there are many enterprises out there that are very, um, they have very strict policies when it comes to upgrading systems to modern browsers. Um, but for whatever reason, installing a desktop application is okay. Um, so, <laughs> so we can, in, in the case of NWGS, we're already dealing with a modern browser um, because it's Chromium under the hood, right? So that can definitely be a, a, an avenue to explore. And even if you don't go on to build a desktop application, I hope that you've gained something of value in this talk. At least you were able to see how we were able to easily create custom solutions with Ember CLI through add-ons. And also, we are hiring at Dockyard. Uh, if you're interested in, in working on really cool Ember apps, we are looking for senior Ember devs. So if you're interested, just come talk to me, come talk to Brian or any um, Dockyard person that you see in the yellow shirts here. Um, and that's all. Thank you for listening. Questions? <laughs> Kitara has a question. Um, do you have, have you had any experience or any attempts to uh, package a Windows application all in one, like a .msi or something where the DLLs are part of the executable, all just as a single application? Um, it, it doesn't work like that. You uh, basically, the best you can do is take the exe, the DLLs, and zip them up. Yeah, I'm just thinking about like for like you were saying an enterprise client, somebody who's running on an old Windows machine, right. 
and not having to tell them to do this and this yeah. and this. And this. So but you can ship them the, the zip file and they can, all they have to do is unzip and then they have the exe file. They can create a desktop shortcut if they want and easily launch it from there. Thanks. Anybody else? Uh, what does the story around shipping an update to an existing app look like? Do you have to ship them like a new binary or can the existing app be aware that there's an update so, available? Um, there are different ways of approaching that. Um, there's nothing that is really uh, formalized, but you can ship, you can make sure that the binary is a very thin client essentially, and maybe you can make sure that the app can sort of update itself. So maybe whenever it knows that it's connected or maybe whenever the application launches, it could detect to see if it's on uh, the latest version and then just download assets down. Um, so that's one way of handling it. Thanks. Anybody else? Oh, another question. <laughs> um, what would these, would these apps be able to make it onto the uh, Mac App Store or the Windows App Store? Um, I valid do not believe so. Why, why is that? I, I do not know, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have, uh, no, I checked out, I, I saw, I remember seeing some thread where people were asking the same question and um, there was something that prevented that from happening. I'm not sure exactly. It could have changed from, since I last checked it, so. Okay, I think people are hungry and they want to listen to Q Kitar Bear. So thank you very much, Estelle. Thank you.